Where's my phone? Okay. What we're going to do, a few people had mentioned that you'd like what I share with you, and I'll still share it on screen, but that I can send you the link. Keep on talking. Uh, on chat. So, um, Achi really didn't come home to do this. As I say, she came home for Shabbat. But as long as she's here. Ah, put it to work. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Vatya. Well, wait. See if we have what to thank her for. <laughs> <laughs> Monkey. He sent it in the format you sent to me. It worked the second time. Hey, well, this now. Woo! Oh, wait. No? Okay, you should be able to go to the chat and see the link. Do you see a link? The link is there. So should we open the link now or is it for after? Oh, it's, you know, I'm gonna share. Okay. But for some reason, a couple of people asked me to do that apparently no, I think it's uh, a great idea okay. but why like are you seeing that now i well i can uh, no i'm not opening it so i can only see the link in the chat and then you can have it yes yeah i i don't know how we would have to get it before leaving the before leaving zoom to you know to get it out of zoom so i don't know I don't, I've never done that before. It's not letting I just us clicked on it and it said you need access. Yeah. And then so it says what, it's going to what do you have to do email. to get access? Uh, I am going to do a copy paste to outside of Zoom if I can. It, it doesn't work if you don't have an, uh, an Apple computer. Remember, if you don't have a Google account. account. Different format. You, you, Rahab, they need a Gmail Google. account for this one. Or this Google. was Gmail. I know, but not everyone has Gmail. Oh, that's uh -huh. what. Uh, what do you do? Can you do it in a Word account, a Word document? I don't know. I'll speak to Ricky again. This you is what, he what or send it. Send it to me. Send me the in an email or something, and then if somebody wants it, I could always email it to them after. Okay. How about that? Good. And okay. I could open it and I could put it in a PDF revise or scan oh, it. That would be easier. perfect. That would be great. terrific. Thanks. Thanks. Oh, Thanks. Doris. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Doris. Okay. Okay. I'm not ready. Okay. It's there though. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. So now I see why it pays to come on a little early. Okay. Yeah. So um, let's return to last week's image of the menorah, the Chanukiah, being on the windowsill. You'll remember that we suggested that that window is a two-way device. Not only do we declare our pride and loyalty to those on the outside, we also acknowledge our exposure to that outside world. Now, if we're exposed to that outside world, we have the opportunity to observe, to like, to dislike, and to take what we want from it. It is the reactions at the time of the Greeks and Antiochus's Hellenizing Zerot decrees that we will explore today. Specifically, two reactions that I am defining as a reaction of martyrdom 
and the other is active rebellion. A word about the martyrs. They were called Hasidim. Now we're not just thinking of, you know, he's a Hasid and dancing and singing, but pietists who believed even when there were troubles, like the Greek troubles, that as long as Jews were faithful to God, they would be protected by him. And when those insisting on continuing to live Jewishly, going against the Greeks' instructions, even when some of them began being killed, this group chose martyrdom. That became for them a thought out, rational ideal. The other group referred to as the rebellers, um, they followed a different type of resistance. They adopted active struggle, military action. Now what's interesting, and I want this to be clear, have I said or anything that indicates that the active military are any less committed to living Jewishly? No. The Maccabees were fighting the Greek attempt at raising earthly power, such as the king, in opposition to God's commandments. I'm gonna say that again. The Greeks were looking to belittle God. And that's what bothered the Maccabees. They didn't so much go to war because they were fighting for religious freedom. That's a subset. They didn't go to war primarily because they were looking to choose and have freedom of conscience. No, they shared with the Hasidim deep devotion to living Jewishly. They shared that same faith, but unlike the Hasidim, the Maccabees believed that the struggle could not be left entirely in the hands of God. Now, is that sacrilegious to think or to say? No. God through the years has made it clear that he's looking for us to partner with him in creation, in repairing. That's clear as we go through from being thrown out of the Garden of Eden till today. We are meant to act. Now, there is a danger though. If we think of ourselves as being equal partners. And we'll return to that in a bit. Now, representing the activists will be Matityahu and his family. And representing the martyrs will be Hannah and her seven sons. Now, this is not the same Hannah that we know, the mother of Samuel, who was the one who initiated a woman praying, a different Hannah. And it's funny though, because I think of a third Hannah, contemporary of Hannah Senesh, 
and they shared all three of them certain strong characteristics. Now, before I begin to share the screen, I have to apologize for two things. The first text that we're going to read is longer than I would have liked. And usually I don't keep them very long. But sometimes you have to, and I can't just give a precy because you have to have a sense of what's being said there and the way it's being said. So I just want you to know that I'm aware of that. I grappled with something else about the first text. You know how sometimes on TV they will write what is going to be seen is going to be a bit graphic and those faint of heart should stay away. So I also thought if I'm even thinking about that, maybe that should not be a text that I'm putting before you. But then I said, no. It's important, especially for what I'm going to be asking later. <laughs> um, so please bear with me. Um, okay, now as I'm sharing the screen. As we read these um, texts, I would like you to keep in mind your own reactions and the reactions that you would imagine a younger generation would react to if they were to read these selections. Okay, I'll repeat that. How do you react? Because you're going to get a gut reaction and I'm hoping you will react and share it with us. There are no rights or wrongs here. And then though, you'll see why I want you to also imagine what your grandchildren, children feel about. Okay, leave it. Just... Okay. So the first, and this is taken from the book of Maccabees, which is not part of the Bible and uh, written by an historian of the time. Okay, so sit back. How long do you want me to defrost this, mom? Until it's defrosted. Please mute yourself. I don't know, honey. Is it still, there's still a bump there? <laughs> On? Yeah. Okay. okay. I'll ask again, please somebody mute yourself. Well, maybe it's me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Well. <laughs> On another occasion, a Jewish mother and her seven sons were arrested. The king was having them beaten to force them to eat pork. Then one of the young men said, what do you hope to gain by doing this? We would rather die than abandon the traditions of our ancestors. This made the king so furious that he gave orders for huge pans and kettles red hot. And it was done immediately. Then to cut off the tongue of the one who had spoken and to scalp him and chop off his hands and feet while his mother and six brothers looked on. Oh my God. What's going on here? Well, she, her, her daughter was there helping here with something. 
It's Dale. They've got two things on. I'm shutting it off. One off. I, okay. Wait, George, maybe if you can mute everyone. I shut it off. Sorry. Oh my God. Okay. Just trying to mute you all. Bill? Can you put a thumbs up if you still hear us? Okay, good. One second. Are you lying? <laughs> oh, one second. Okay, you hear me? Okay. I'm not gonna repeat. And if you have a question, as always, unmute yourself. Then he told his men to cut off the tongue of the one who had spoken and scalp him and chop off his hands and feet while his mother and six brothers looked on. After the young man had been reduced to a helpless mass of breathing flesh, the king gave orders for him to be carried over and thrown into one of the pans. As a cloud of smoke streamed up from the pan, the brothers and their mother encouraged one another to die bravely saying, the Lord God is looking on and understands our suffering. After the first brother had died in this way, the soldiers started amusing themselves with the second one by tearing the hair and skin from his head. Then they asked him, now, will you eat this pork or do you want us to chop off your hands and feet one by one? He replied in his native language, I will never eat it. So the soldiers tortured him just as they had the first one. But with his dying breath, he cried out to the king, you butcher. You may kill us, but the king of the universe will raise us from the dead and give us eternal life because we have obeyed his laws. The soldiers began entertaining themselves with the third brother. When he was ordered to stick out his tongue, he quickly did so. Then he bravely held out his hands and courageously said, God gave these to me, but his laws mean more to me than my own hands and I know God will give them back to me again. The king and those with him were amazed at his courage and at his willingness to suffer. After he had died, the soldiers tortured the fourth one in the same cruel way. But his final words were, I am glad to die at your hands because we have the assurance that God will raise us from death. But there will be no resurrection to life for you, Antiochus. When the soldiers took the fifth boy and began torturing him, he looked the king squarely in the eye and said, you have the power to do whatever you want with us, even though you also are mortal. But do not think that God has abandoned our people. Just wait. God will use his great power to torture you and your descendants. Then the soldiers took the sixth boy and just before he died, he said, make no mistake. We are suffering what we deserve because we have sinned against our God. That's why all these terrible things are happening to us. But don't think for a minute that you will avoid being punished for fighting against God. The mother was the most amazing one of them all and she deserves a special place in our memory. Although she saw her seven sons die in a single day, she endured it with great courage because she trusted in the Lord. She combined womanly emotion with manly courage. 
and spoke words of encouragement to each of her sons in their native language. I do not know, she said, how your life began in my womb. I was not the one who gave you life and breath and put together each part of your body. It was God who did it. God who created the universe, the human race, and all that exists. He is merciful and he will give you back life and breath again because you love his laws more than you love yourself. Antiochus was sure that the mother was making fun of him. So he did his best to convince her youngest son to abandon the traditions of his ancestors. He promised not only to make the boy rich and famous, but to place him in a position of authority and to give him the title friend of the king. But the boy paid no attention to him. So Antiochus tried to persuade the boy's mother to talk him into saving his life. And after much persuasion, she agreed to do so. But leaning over her son, she fooled the cruel tyrant by saying in her native language, my son, have pity on me. Remember that I carried you in my womb for nine months and nursed you for three years. I have taken care of you and looked after all your needs up to the present day. So I urge you, my child, to look at the sky and the earth. Consider everything you see there and realize that God made it all from nothing, just as he made the human race. Don't be afraid of this butcher. Give up your life willingly and prove yourself worthy of your brothers so that by God's mercy, I may receive you back with them at the resurrection. Before she could finish speaking, the boy said, King Antiochus, what are you waiting for? I refuse to obey your orders. I only obey the commands in the law which Moshe gave to our ancestors. You have thought up all kinds of cruel things to do to our people, but you won't escape the punishment that God has in store for you. It is true that our living Lord is angry with us and is making us suffer because of our sins in order to correct and discipline us. But this will last only a short while for we are still his servants and he will forgive us. May my brothers and I be the last to suffer the anger of almighty God, which he has just brought upon our entire nation. These words of ridicule made Antiochus so furious that he had the boy tortured even more cruelly than his brothers. And so the boy died with absolute trust in the Lord, never unfaithful for a minute. Last of all, the mother was put to death. So, quick, from your gut, reactions to what we just experienced. Unmute yourselves if when you have something to say, please. Don't be intimidated. Speak from the heart. I don't think too many people today have that kind of faith, not even our generation. Okay, good. Thank you, Linda. There's Any kind other? Of horror. Well, Sorry? Horror. Oh, feeling of horror. Now, what is the horror about, from, based on? That's a good question. It's, it's both, you know, that Antiochus would do such a thing. That's one horror. I think there are at least two more. And I, I think, you know, that, you know, that they gave their lives. I think there's a certain horror to that as well. Because, you know, once you're dead, you can't carry on, you know, praying to Hashem or doing what he requires. Okay, a third. For the soldiers you know, to have been so barbaric and listen to that kind of king and being able to tear these people apart and do what they did, they can't be human, they're animals. 
Okay, and we've seen that in other situations. Yet but another. How, how, how great could their sins have been to justify this? And why are we focusing on this? I find it totally revolting. Well, it's part of uh, what we began last week. Um, it is a reaction. Yeah. When we face and have to make decisions. And it's not as if this is a dead issue. I find, and it's interesting that nobody's mentioned yet. Uh, I, I'm going to mention something. Go ahead. The, the, hor the horror is the mother not seeking to save her sons. Exactly. Who is that? I'm Mel. I'm thinking Mel. Mel Perlmutter. Hi, Mel. I'm um, thinking Racha of the Inquisition and the Jews that chose to hide their Ju Judaism in order to live because life, life is above all. And they stayed alive by hiding it if it meant eating a piece of pork. They did it in the Inquisition in order to stay alive and hit their Judaism. We know this. And, and that was a different decision. And had these boys and their mother eaten a piece of pork and, and been able to stay alive which would have been better? They made that. They made that choice. I, I truthfully, I mean, I've thought about if I were in the Inquisition, I would have hid my Judaism just to stay alive because life is above all. But that's okay. that was my gut feeling. They didn't have to do that. I don't think God would have expected that kind of suffering. And I Raha? think Raha? that what Ellen said before, that's true. They're putting. They're willing to say, if we're going through this, God must want us because we must have done something wrong. I'm sorry. I don't think that's true. Who else? Who else? Gladys. Gladys. Hi. It reminds me of the um, extremist Jews today, of fundamentalists of all kinds. I, I just find it, um, you know, we'll meet again when we, when, in the resurrection. I, I, it's, it's horrifying to me. Yeah. Yeah. Rafa. Rafa, I, I keep thinking back to the Holocaust. In the Holocaust, the Jews that were being massacred didn't have choice. From mm -hmm. what people are saying here, there was choice. And through a different choice, they could have done constructive things to fight back at Antiochus in, in different ways. That's what puts my back up, I think. One of the things. Yeah. What, what I find interesting about this horrific story, because it really is, is the fact that it reminded me a lot of some of the some of what we read during the martyrology on, on Yom Kippur. Yes. And yet it's a part of the Hanukkah story that most of us have really never heard before. We've heard about the Maccabees and we've heard of, I, I mean, I had a, a fleeting idea about Hannah and her seven sons, but never understood the horrible things that happened to them. Um, and it's really not a part of the story that we know. Yeah. Um, now, getting back to what Mel mentioned, that a mother would be encouraging her child, all of her children to do this, that also uh, seems very hard to handle. Now, being brutally honest here though, we know that some people in this class live in a country where children have to go off to the army and there are parents that support that or parents that moved here knowing that their children would be going into the army. What is the difference? I want to hear it said, what is the difference between these parents and that mother in that story? Good question. Hmm? Good question. A bracha. Dan. I, um, I was thinking about this mother <clears throat> reading Natan's book, Avital, 
on her travels. In the middle of his hunger strike, he was near death. And the authorities said, speak to him, tell him to call it off. And she says, he won't do it. He won't do it. I'm not going to do that. And she was heavily criticized as being some sort of zealot that uh, was a religion. They, they accused her of being a religious zealot that wouldn't take care to have her husband stop a hunger strike. They, and, and they forced fed him and he was near death. And meanwhile, what happened was the world leadership ganged up on the Soviet Union and said, listen, you can't let him die. There is an example of a, of, a, of a wife who stood her ground and wouldn't give in. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I, I... Baraka, there is a difference with our children who go to okay, the Okay, go army. ahead, please, Tupor. There, there is a difference because um, th there isn't that sense that every single kid who's going to go to the army, God forbid, is going to suffer or die or be wounded. There's almost a sense, of my son was here as a lone soldier. There was a sense of denial that anything God forbid could ever happen to him, as opposed to this mother who knew, who made a choice. That wasn't the choice when my son came. I was proud of him. I couldn't stop being proud of what he chose to do. And, but, but I was also in a constant, I'm being very personal here, but a lot of you I've known now a lot of years, I was in a constant state of denial of God forbid anything should happen. And, I, and, and it, there's a difference than what, what this mother was doing. She sent her children on a different type of horror. Yeah. I, Marilyn. Um, I just think, she may have been more realistic than we give her credit for. And knowing what Antiochus was, she knew they were all going to die anyway. And she knew she was going to die anyway. So uh, she just had faith and she, she didn't give in to him. Faith in what? In, in God. <laughs> in her own faith, whatever it was. But she just knew. I mean, no matter what she said, she, she, she just knew that he was going to kill them. Even if they ate the pork. Yeah. Okay, all right. Let's continue. Oh, Bacha. Get rid of this. Okay. okay, all right. Now, a different picture. Warn you about, but I'm curious to see your comments about this one. Much shorter. Then the king's officers, who were forcing the people to give up their religion, came to the town of Modi'in. And what I love about this is that Modi'in is about half an hour away from here. And I have cousins there. I have an uncle there. It's, uh, it's historic. It's modern. To make them offer sacrifices. Many Jews, among them Matityahu and his sons, gathered together. Then the king's messengers answered and said to Matityahu, You are a leading man, great and distinguished in this town, surrounded with sons and brothers. Now be the first to come forward and carry out the king's command, as all the heathen and the men of Judah and those who are left in Jerusalem have done, and you and your sons will be distinguished with presents of silver and gold and many royal commissions. Then Matityahu answered and said, 
and a loud voice. If all the pages in the king's dominions listen to him, forsake each of them the religion of their ancestors and choose to follow his commands instead, yet I and my sons and my brothers will live in accordance with the covenant of our ancestors. God forbid that we should abandon the Torah and the ordinances. We will not listen to the message of the king or depart from our religion to the right hand or to the left. As he finished these words, a Jew went up before the eyes of all of them to offer a sacrifice as the king commanded on the altar in Modin. And Matityahu saw him and was filled with zeal and his soul was stirred and he was routed to anger and ran up and slaughtered him upon the altar. Then Matijau came out, cried out in a loud voice in the town and said, let everybody who is zealous for the law and stands by the covenant, follow me. And he and his sons fled to the mountains and left all they possessed in the town. And Matijau and his friends went about and tore down the altars and forcibly circumcised all the uncircumcised children that they found within the borders of Israel. What do you think of that? Anything horrible, horrific, horrifying in that? Gloria, you're, you're turning your head. What are you saying? Somehow, I can't justify Matis Yahoo's action or reaction because he's just as guilty of committing sins and crimes too. You can't forcibly do this kind of thing in the name of God and say you're doing the right thing because God told you to come out and do this. I just can't buy that. I'm sorry. Okay. Anybody agree or disagree with Gloria? Here he is. He has a right to be upset, maybe even topple the pagan altars that are there. But here he is deciding that he can take the law in his hands and kill that Jew who is doing that. Anybody? And, and then in, is, in essence, is, he's playing God. And, and who of us has that right? I'm probably not muted. Mm -hmm. Rocha, maybe maybe Matityahu had had some foresight. When I read read the first part of this um, this um, part of the story. The promises that are being made almost remind me of the promises that the Germans made to the Jewish leadership in many towns. You know, this will help you save the people. And if you do oh, this, you'll be you. saved. And you know what? We know where that led. Now, that's the question. Is there ever a cause that is so very important that it calls for such zealous behavior. Is there ever a time? Well, I think a lot of people and uh, one never knows what we ourselves would do mm -hmm. if, the, if we were faced with God forbid the destruction of Israel or an, an attack on Israel or who knows what we would do. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we talk about uh, soldiers or individuals who in the heat of a moment shoot a Palestinian. 
an Arab and that that was wrong. But on the other hand, there's there are situations where it comes about that there is a need to do such. Um, we're not condoning something that was not necessary, not necessary. Um, but as Marlene pointed out, sometimes you anticipate, if I don't do this now, then what's going to be? Is that not why Israel took out with Elon Ramon that first uh, nuclear? Anticipating. Okay, let's move on. We all remember Rabbi Yitz Greenberg, who has just puts this very nicely. The controversy between Matityahu and the main wing of the pietists, the Hasidim, was over how to properly apply their shared values. Matityahu and his men were saying that God had given a significant role to humans. The pietists don't accept that, including the authority to apply principles of the tradition creatively. As for the passive, passionate pietists, theirs was not to question why, theirs was but to do or die. Now, what do you think that means when it says that they can take upon themselves the authority to work with tradition creatively? What does that mean, work with tradition creatively? Would it mean take matters into their own hands? Um, that's one of the steps. But before they take it into their own hands or actually do something, why creatively? I would have perhaps used a word more analytically that they would have looked at a situation and said, knowing what we know about God and his expectations and his expectations of us, I think we can take this in our own hands and do what we have decided is the right thing for this situation. I don't know what else they would mean, he would mean by saying creatively. Bracha, somebody you and I both have known in our lives would have said religion was seichel. Have you ever heard that before? Yes. So seichel in that uh, you have to use Seichel, and that's why I have said there are many places in the Torah where it will give a specific commandment, very specific. But then at the end of that verse, it ends it with the words, Viasita tov." you should do the right and straight. And I've always took that to mean you should be doing that commandment, but do what's right for that particular situation. That gives uh, a human an awful lot of power and, uh, and humans aren't so good at that. Well, that's the danger of giving us that responsibility because some of us we can trust will know how to deal with that responsibility. And you're right, others won't and others don't always. But God gave us the ability to think, to distinguish. And so if we don't use that, it's a cop out to yeah, just but, say, but, well, God did this and he must want it that way. Yeah, but fundamentalists say that too. Yes, it is complicated. It is complicated. Bracha, but, this yes. wasn't this hey. wasn't, yeah, this wasn't the first case of somebody killing somebody else in, no. in the name of religion. You've got the, you've got the high priest who kills, who, who kills Pinchas. The, the, when, yeah, Pinchas. Pinchas. But did you saw Pinchas as a model? But what was the difference? Pinchas, he was interrupting a man and a woman that were involved in something that nece wouldn't necessarily have meant the end 
of the world. So there, it's a little questionable. Here, Matityahu fears for the life of Yiddishkeit and our people and God's Torah. But the Pinchel okay. also maybe fears for the life of the Jews to come well, and the histories to come. And that's what motivated him. Um, yeah. It is very difficult because as Linda said, there are going to be people that are going to abuse. But we know that we don't not put regulations in place and say something is permitted because of those who might do the wrong. We can say that about so much. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. It is. It is. Now, um, I wanted us to not take the military lightly and for us to understand that the Maccabees took the laws in the Torah very seriously and what they would do before they went off to battle. And I bring this to again point out that these Maccabees, they were taking action, but they believed no less than the pietists. And I think that's very important. So these are some examples that you could read in the book of Exodus or in Deuteronomy. When you go out to war against your enemies and you see horses and chariots and an army greater than your own, you shall not be afraid of them for the Lord your God who brought you up from the land of Egypt will be with you. This is an example that Judah did this, Judah Maccabee when he took over. Before his people would go out on a battle, he brought in a priest who would give a pep talk. When you are drawing near to battle, the priest shall come toward, forward and speak to the army and say to them, hear, O Israel, today you are drawing near for battle against your enemies. Do not be weak hearted or afraid, alarmed or frightened by them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies and give you victories. This is so important because at the same time that Matityahu has said, God needs us to work with him. They're also pointing out here by saying, realize God needs us, but that we couldn't do it alone. We can't take full credit for it because there is that danger of forgetting God's input. And then we become, um, we feel like we are Alec Baldwin, the way he felt in that movie, I think called Malice, where he's the surgeon and he actually calls himself God. Six, is there anyone who has planted a vineyard and not yet plucked its fruit? Let him return home lest he die in battle and another pluck its fruit. These uh -huh. are ways to let people who are light and don't feel they're really capable to, without being embarrassed, go home. Is there anyone who has betrothed a woman and not yet married her? Let him return home lest he die in battle and another marry her. The officials <laughs> shall continue to speak to the army. Is there anyone who is afraid and weak hearted? Let him return home or else he might make the hearts of his fellows melt as he does. When the officials have finished speaking to the army, military commanders shall be appointed over them. When you draw near a city to attack it, offer it terms of peace. First speak, if it agrees to your terms of peace and lets you in, all the people to be found in it shall serve you in forced labor. But if it refuses to make peace with you, and instead joins battle with you, lay siege to it. And when the Lord your God delivers it into your power, put every male in it to the sword. But the women and children and livestock and anything else in the city, all its spoil you may take as plunder for yourselves, and you may enjoy the spoil of your enemies, which the Lord your God has given you. That is how you shall deal with any city at a considerable distance from you, which does not belong to these nations here. But in the cities of these peoples that the Lord your God is giving you as a heritage, you shall not leave a single soul alive, 
you must put them all under the ban. The Chitzites, the Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Yebuzites, just as the Lord your God has commanded you, so that they do not teach you to do all the abominations that they do for their gods, and you thus sin against the Lord your God. So what is that almost saying? We can't trust that they're going to be okay. And if they're not, if they're going to influence you, well, we have to be rid of them before. Now that sounds cruel. And that's why we look at Sarah sounding cruel when she wants Ishmael away from her son. But was she entirely wrong? And to finish up, when you are at war with a city and have to lay siege to it, for a long time before you capture it, you shall not destroy its trees by putting an ax to them. You may eat of them, but you must not cut them down. Are the trees of the field human beings that they should be included in your siege? However, those trees, which you know are not fruit trees, you may destroy. You may cut them to build siege works against the city that is waging war with you until it falls. Now, again, we read these laws now because I want to remind you of what I said at the very beginning. Antiochus wasn't just looking to have more people be Hellenized. He was looking for him to be considered the God. So the Maccabees, by incorporating these laws, and just by incorporating, before we go out to battle, we are going to read you these laws. It's to impress upon themselves that we're doing all of this for our safety. And part of our safety is being able to live as Jews. And that we don't forget or become too overblown up with ourselves and forget God. Now, just an interesting aside, since we talked about Shabbat last week in making, having to make a choice between Hanukkah candles, Shabbat candles, if you don't have enough money. One of the scenes also written about in the Maccabees um, is 200 families that have run away to the Judean desert, trying to escape because the Greeks are going after them. And they remain there. And the Greeks come Dafka on Shabbat. Why do they come on Shabbat? Because they know that these families are not going to fight back because it is Shabbat. And that's the way it's been. Well, a few days later, Matijau and his clan hear about this catastrophe. 200 families, over a thousand people were massacred. Matityahu and his, what were called guerrilla fighters in the Judean hills, they hear about this massacre, they sit as a council and they make for the first time the decision, if they attack us on Shabbat, we fight back. And that was an innovation. You might say, but we know that pikuach nefesh, saving a life, is allowed when it's Shabbat. But the pietists weren't open to that. Weren't open. Weren't open. Now, you know, I thought of this when we were talking about the martyr. Um, when units, army units, are being inducted very often, the ceremony, and I'm not sure it takes place there anymore, would be inducted on Masada, the top of Masada. A number of years ago, I remember reading, I'll have to look it up, that people started to object to that because of the group of martyrs who let themselves, kill themselves rather than be killed by the Romans. And that is not a message that you want to give to new people in the army. I'll have to look that up. We don't idolize 
martyrs. But our tradition has had a sense that there are times that it is necessary. And that's my question. When we look at the family values that we mentioned last week, interesting, the only one that came up was creativity. And memory mm -hmm. is in bold because we added that to this list. Does that list prepare us for concepts, basic to Hanukkah narrative, national struggle for independence, military heroism, self-sacrifice, and believing in miracles, being a martyr, or being a zealot. So these are part of the lovely Hanukkah story. Mm -hmm. And Ellen referred to the all lit Hanukkah last week as being so beautiful. And it mm -hmm. is beautiful. So I'm certainly not looking to take away from that, but we are all adults and should be aware that these are issues that are very prominent in this narrative of Hanukkah. What are we prepared? What have we been transmitting to our children? Eugene Wiener, who uh, teaches at Haifa, um, writes about martyrs and he has a concern. God forbid any of us should have to be a martyr but he's just concerned about the young generation. Um, and I think Linda said it, whether we, our age would be willing to do it. Um, he doesn't see anybody stepping up if need be. Unlike the classical examples of martyrological conviction, which we have discussed, contemporary Western man has been characterized as preoccupied with the self. According to this point of view, there are no absolute or intrinsic hierarchies of goals and values. And it is important to maintain multiple perspectives. That's the key word. I'm not into one cause that is so demanding. Now I hate generalizations, but you decide if that characterizes the world we live in. And he brings us what maybe some of you have heard, um, Fritz Perl's Gestalt Therapy Prayer. I do my thing and you do your thing. I am not in this world to live up to your expectations and you are not in this world to live up to mine. You are you. And I am I, if by chance we find each other, it's beautiful. And if not, it can't be helped. <laughs> In this context of fighting for a cause, a very important cause, this would not be something that a cheerleader in that situation would be reading to us. Um, sorry, people, these are thoughts that we have to have because even if that is the mood of how too many people think, there is still too much too much that needs to be fixed in the world if we all take our own cause and unite with others we can't give that up and we have models of people having fought for causes groups of people individuals that uh, Stan and Debbie uh, have mentioned with uh, not only Natan but Avital um, I'm going to give you an assignment for next week. Please listen carefully. It's not that you all have to do this. And if you want to, please be in contact with me. Enough people have my email and the shul does. I give my permission if you don't have it. 
I would like to ask five of you to think of someone that you consider a Maccabee, and that's wide open. A contemporary person, someone we know, someone we don't know. Thinking about the issues we've talked about, standing up for a cause, being committed, devoted, have done something for the world or for our people, or maybe somebody who's done something for his people. And I'm only asking you to speak for two minutes because, you know, I have to do most of the speaking. Um, and I'll experience what it's like to be on mute when you do. But really, um, five of you, please uh, be in touch with me over the next couple of days. And um, I'll be happy, look forward to that. I thought I would be a little uh, innovative. Okay. Anybody else want to share something about this very light subject? I Linda? do. Yeah. Yes. I, I just wanted to say, you know, it's obvious and everybody we're here studying this because we know it. But I just want to reiterate that you know, by bringing up all these issues and these various, the history and everything. I mean, what I love about Judaism that it, 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 it isn't so dictatorial and that we have the reinterpretations and that we can rethink things and that we're open to rethinking and throughout all the Talmudic discussions. And so a class like this, maybe we don't come away with the answer, but it makes us think and that sensitizes us. And that is what is important about our Jewish tradition. Absolutely, I, I agree. Yeah. That's what I'm looking to do, to get you to think. And as Sipora said, somebody else said, use our Seichel. You know what Seichel is, it's Rosh Gadol. Um, and, and the people who were willing to just sit there have what's called the Rosh Katan, not using, not looking at the bigger picture, not looking. But again, it's so true. There will be people who will distort that, take advantage of it. But again, you can't stop doing in a particular case because others might do the wrong. You gotta do what you gotta do. Anyone else? Hey, Bracha. I just want to mention that they still do the ceremony at Masada. It is still? Why? Did one of your grandsons do it there? Yes. For real. The most For recent real. one. Okay. Bev has two grandchildren that are in the army at the moment. Um, okay. May God watch over them and all our other uh, Maccabees. Okay. Amen. 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 